You, God, and a KJV Bible, by Eric Newman, copyright 2017. Copyright Notice The author hereby grants permission for any and all material within this Bible study to be reproduced free of any fees to the author, provided that said materials are not sold for a profit. Quotations The only material quoted in this book is the Word of God in the King James Version. No commentaries or scholars are quoted, because God's Word is important, not man's Word. As such, I encourage all readers to be good Bereans by searching the scriptures to see if what I have said is true. Acts 17 verse 11 It is okay if you do not agree with what I say, but it is not okay if your disagreement is not based upon the Word of God in its proper context, which involves rightly dividing the Word of Truth. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 Goal the goal of this Bible study is to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, so that members of the body of Christ may come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. Contact the author. Therefore, the author encourages any disagreements be brought to his attention so that future versions of this Bible study can be changed if deemed necessary. You may email the author at bibledivider at gmail.com. Books by Eric Newman All books are available in paperback and in Kindle formats by going to www.amazon.com slash author slash Bible Divider. You may also access the author's sermons by going to Eric has been working on a Bible study guide since 2011. So far, the following books are available. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Hebrews, James and 1 Peter, coming in 2017. Romans, Genesis. In addition, the following books are available http colon slash slash www.youtube.com slash user slash bible divider slash videos a bible believers bible summary how to understand the bible section one is a narrative of the bible from beginning to end while section two gives a one sentence summary and a key verse from each book of the bible 84 pages bible perversions how Satan Changes God's Word to Lead You Astray Over 850 Bible Verses are listed in the KJV, NIV, NKJV, and NLT with comments to show how modern versions stray from the truth of God found in the KJV. A topical guide and an explanation of why modern versions are perverted are given. 248 Pages how to be led by the Holy Spirit, discerning God's will for your life. This book examines a megachurch pastor's decision-making process, compares this process to scripture, and shows God's way to be led by the Spirit in making decisions in your life. 34 Pages A Bible Believer's Critique of Ironsides Wrongly Dividing the Word of Truth, A Defense of Paul's Mystery, 150 Pages. Acts Introduction the book of Acts shows Israel's history after the cross. The Holy Ghost is given in Acts 2. The nation, as a whole, rejects God's law covenant with them for the final time, as they reject the ministry of the Holy Ghost. Jesus had said, Whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, Matthew 12 verse 32. Thus, when Israel makes their final rejection of the Holy Ghost with the stoning of Stephen, Jesus stands at the right hand of God. Acts 7 verses 55 to 56. Old Testament scripture shows that Jesus standing at the right hand of God is incredibly significant. Psalm 110 verse 1 says that God the Father instructed God the Son to sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Acts 2 verse 23 says, In talking to Israel, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain Jesus. Therefore, thine enemies, according to Acts 2 verse 23, are Israel. Isaiah 3 verses 13 to 14 says, The Lord standeth up to plead, and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people, and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. The vineyard is the house of Israel, according to Isaiah 5 verse 7. Thus, Jesus standing at the right hand of God, in Acts 7 verses 55 to 56, 
says that God has judged Israel as apostate and is now setting aside his plan to reconcile the earth back to himself through the nation of Israel. He does not end this plan, because the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, Romans 11 verse 29. Therefore, God will still reconcile the earth back to himself through the nation of Israel. However, he sets this plan aside for now, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and Israel is not ready to enter it, even though they are supposed to be God's kingdom of priests in the kingdom to reach the Gentiles with the gospel, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6. In Genesis 1 verse 1, God created the heaven and the earth. The next verse starts with, and the earth. From Genesis 1 verse 2 through Acts 7 verse 60, God's focus has been on the earth. Beginning with Acts 9, God shifts his focus to the heaven. The heavens are not clean in his sight. Job 15 verse 15. Because Satan, Ezekiel 28 verses 15 to 16, and one third of the angels rebelled. Against God, Revelation 12 verse 4. Therefore, the heaven needs to be reconciled back to God, just like the earth. However, if God had talked about his plan to reconcile the heaven back to himself before, Satan would not have crucified the Lord of glory, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8. In order to reconcile both the earth and the heaven back to God, Jesus had to die on a cross. The Old Testament never mentions this. The Old Testament says that the Christ would die for the sins of Israel, Isaiah 53 verses 3 to 8, and he would do so by being sacrificed on the altar in the temple in Jerusalem, Psalm 118 verse 27, as the complete Passover lamb to take away their sins. John 1 verse 29. Therefore, when Jesus came into Jerusalem, Satan got the Jewish leaders to arrest him and send him off to the Romans to keep him from being sacrificed on the altar as the atonement for Israel's sins. What Satan did not know is that, by being lifted up on the cross, he would draw all men to himself. John 12 verse 32. In other words, both Jews, the Jews said, His blood be on us. Matthew 27 verse 25. Dot and Gentiles, Pilate said, I have power to crucify thee, John 19 verse 10, were involved in his crucifixion, which gives both Jews and Gentiles the opportunity to be saved. Therefore, Jesus did not give his life a ransom for many on the altar, Matthew 20 verse 28, but he gave his life a ransom for all, to be testified in due time, 1 Timothy 2 verse 6, on the cross. Paul was an apostle born out of due time, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 7 to 8, to give this testimony. Therefore, once Israel is set aside, God calls Paul in Acts 9 to go to the whole world, and not just to the Jews. The Lord said about Paul that, He is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles, and kings, and the children of Israel, Acts 9 verse 15. Not only that, but Paul was given new information to preach. What Peter preached to Israel in early Acts was what God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, Acts 3 verse 21. What Paul preached, beginning in Acts 9, was the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, Romans 16 verses 25 to 26. This new information was that salvation comes by trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, as atonement for sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4, rather than repenting and being baptized for the remission of sins, as Peter said, Acts 2 verse 38. Paul said, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17. It was in Paul first that Jesus Christ might shew forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting, 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. Paul said, The gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ, Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12. He preached the dispensation of God which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, Colossians 1 verse 25. When God called Paul, he had set aside Israel's program. However, God still wanted Israel to be saved. Therefore, God gave Israel the opportunity to be saved under this new program committed to Paul. It is Paul's going to Israel that is shown from Acts 9 through the end of Acts. In this portion of Acts, we see Paul preaching the gospel to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Romans 1 verse 16. 
Thus, Paul's pattern is to go to the Jewish synagogue, preach the gospel, and then go to the Gentiles with the gospel. Just like we saw Israel reject the gospel of the kingdom three times in Acts 1 to 7, see Acts 4 verses 15 to 18, 5 verses 17 to 18, 7 colon 54 59, we see Israel reject the gospel of the grace of God three times in Acts 13 verses 44 to 46, 18 colon 5 6, and 28 colon 25 28. This period of time is called the diminishing of Israel, Romans 11 verse 12. Israel diminished away, and Paul focused exclusively on the Gentiles after Acts 28, as the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13. That is why the book of Acts ends after chapter 28. It has shown the fall of Israel in rejecting the gospel of the kingdom, preached by Peter and the believing remnant of Israel and it has shown the diminishing away of Israel in rejecting the gospel of the grace of God under Paul's ministry. Thus, Acts ends, not with Paul's death, but with Israel's death, having rejected God's salvation, both in earthly places and in heavenly places. If you do not understand these things that the book of Acts teaches you, you will never understand the New Testament. That is why more commentary is provided by this writer on Acts than on any other book of the New Testament. Summary, the at-hand phase of the kingdom goes away due to Israel's unbelief, 7, 55-56, and God begins reconciling the heavenly places back to himself by saving Paul and all those who believe his gospel, Romans 16 verse 25. Key passage, 755, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. 1. Jesus instructs the disciples in the kingdom of God, v. 3, he ascends to heaven, v. 9, and he chooses Matthias, verses 15 to 26, to complete the twelve apostles who will sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel, Matthew 19, verse 28. 1. Colon 1. The former treatise is the book of Luke. Luke wrote the book of Luke to Theophilus, Luke 1, verse 3, and he is writing Acts to him, as well. Luke is about Jesus' earthly ministry to Israel, and Acts is about the Holy Ghost's earthly ministry to Israel. 1 colon 2 3 These verses give the purpose of Jesus' 40 day ministry with the disciples after his resurrection. He stuck around to 1 give them proofs that he is the Messiah and will set up God's kingdom on earth in the future, 2 give them commandments to follow during the tribulation period, namely, to preach the gospel to the lost sheep of Israel, and 3 speak of the things of God's kingdom to give them motivation to continue to preach the gospel of the kingdom throughout the tribulation period. There are two reasons why Jesus was with the disciples for 40 days after his resurrection. 1. 40 is the number of probation in the Bible. For example, there were 40 days of rain in Noah's day and Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Therefore, Jesus was with his disciples for 40 days to prepare them for the Holy Ghost's ministry, and 2. The Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost, 2 colon 1, which was 50 days after the Passover the day Jesus was crucified. Jesus said that the Holy Ghost would not come unless he left and sent him to them, John 16 verse 7. Therefore, he had to stay less than 50 days in order for the Holy Ghost to come to them on the day of Pentecost. 1 colon 4 5 The promise of the Father is the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Pentecost was the Feast of Weeks, celebrating the first fruits of harvest, Exodus 34 verse 22. Spiritually speaking, the fields are white already to harvest, John 4 verse 35, meaning that the lost sheep of the house of Israel are ready to be found. The little flock needs the Holy Ghost to empower them with the words to say, the miracles to perform, and the discernment to determine who believes the gospel of the kingdom and who does not. That is why Jesus will send the Holy Ghost. And, since the Holy Ghost will bring forth spiritual fruit in that the lost sheep of Israel will be saved, his coming represents the first fruits of harvest, which makes it appropriate that he be sent to the disciples on the day of Pentecost. Thus, the not many days hence that the disciples have to wait for the Holy Ghost to come refers to less than 10 days from now, since Jesus has been with his disciples 40 days since his resurrection, which was two days after Passover, 
and Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. Thus, the coming of the Holy Ghost is linked to the feast days. The Holy Ghost, then, is not waiting, as Pentecostalists claim, for the disciples to be in one spirit or one accord, two, colon, one. Rather, he is waiting for the day of Pentecost to fully come, two, colon, one. Since many of the lost sheep of Israel will be coming to Jerusalem for the Feast of Weeks since it is one of the three annual feasts at which all Jewish males must appear before the Lord in the temple, Deuteronomy 16 verse 16, Jesus tells his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Ghost to come. Also, being baptized with the Holy Ghost completes the little flock's ordination as priests of God, as a priest had to be washed with water, their water baptism, Exodus 29 verse 4 and anointed with oil, type of the Holy Ghost, Exodus 29 verse 7. That is what John the Baptist told them when they were water baptized, Mark 1 verse 8, and it is what Jesus says now just before they receive the Holy Ghost. 1 colon 6-7 When the little flock first believed the gospel of the kingdom, they fully expected Jesus to overthrow the Romans and establish God's kingdom on earth right then. His death threw them for a loop, such that they were offended and Christ had to restore them to belief. Now that they again believe that God will establish his kingdom on earth, they are a little hesitant to assume he will do it right then. Therefore, they ask Jesus if he will at this. Time Restore Again the Kingdom to Israel, Acts 1 verse 6. In hindsight, we know that the answer is no, but only because the nation of Israel as a whole did not believe the gospel of the kingdom. If Jesus told them, no, no kingdom yet, because all of your hard work of preaching the gospel will go to waste, because Israel will reject the gospel, they would not have preached the gospel, and Israel would not have been given the chance to believe it, as Jesus had promised them in Matthew 12 verses 32 to 33. Therefore, Jesus tells them that it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. Fundamental Christianity says that God replaced his earthly kingdom with a spiritual kingdom in heaven once Jesus was crucified, because Israel had rejected their Messiah. However, here we are after the resurrection, and the disciples are asking if Jesus will restore the kingdom at this time. This means that, in the 40 days that Jesus spent with his apostles after his resurrection, he taught them that God still planned to set up his eternal kingdom on earth, and that Israel was still his chosen people through whom he would do this. The question was not, since Israel rejected you as their Messiah, I guess there is no earthly kingdom for you. So, are we now going to the Gentiles to preach eternal life in heaven? No. Jesus had told them that the kingdom program was still going on, which is why they asked about the kingdom being restored to Israel. The question was about timing. It is only because the mystery was not to be revealed until after the stoning of Stephen that Jesus does not answer their question. But, their question does give clear proof that God was still planning on establishing his eternal kingdom on earth with Israel ruling with him, even after the cross. Therefore, Acts is a continuation of the at-hand phase of the kingdom that was started by God with John the Baptist, Matthew 3 verse 2. 1 colon 8 rather, the disciples are to work without asking questions. They are just servants doing their duty, Luke 17 verse 10. The power of the Holy Ghost is not the speaking in tongues, as Pentecostalists claim. The power is to know what miracles to ask the Father to perform through them so that the lost sheep may believe the gospel of the kingdom, John 15 verses 7 to 8, and then to know if someone actually has believed the gospel so that they can either remit their sins or retain them, John 20 verses 22 to 23. The power to forgive or not forgive sins is much greater than the power to speak in tongues, for the power of forgiveness means they have the power to let someone into God's kingdom or not. That is why Jesus told Peter that he would give him the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 16 verse 19. We see Peter exercising this power in 5 colon 3 dash 10, when he pronounces death sentences upon Ananias and Sapphira for lying to the Holy Ghost. The reaction is that great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things, 511. By contrast, the reaction to the speaking in tongues was, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine, 2, colon 12 13. There is power behind the death sentences that causes fear, but the speaking in tongues looks more like a magic trick that causes amazement and mocking.
Once they receive the Holy Ghost, they are to start preaching the gospel of the kingdom in Jerusalem, then go to the rest of Judah, then go to the northern territory of Israel, Samaria, and then go to the Gentiles. Because they will not finish going through all of Israel before Jesus' second coming, Matthew 10 verse 23, they are to preach only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10 verse 6, until then. Therefore, although the commission is ultimately to go to all the world with the gospel, Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20, they will not go to any Gentile territories and preach the gospel until God's kingdom physically comes on earth. Jesus alludes to this in this verse by dividing the world into Jew and Gentile, because he says that they are to be witnesses both in Jerusalem, etc. Both means two, and the two categories here are, one, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, the Jews, and two, the uttermost part of the earth, the Gentiles. The Jews are reached before Jesus' second coming, and the Gentiles are reached in Jesus' millennial reign. Because Jesus was speaking to Israel about restoring the kingdom to Israel, 1 colon 6, there is no commission in the current dispensation of grace to go to other nations with the gospel. That being said, we are also not excluded from going to other nations with the gospel. We are just given the ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18, without any geographical boundaries, because, in the dispensation of grace, God is no respecter of persons, Romans 2 verse 11. Do not allow Christianity to trick you into believing that Jerusalem means starting from your hometown and then going to the rest of the world with the gospel. Jerusalem means Jerusalem. If Jesus wanted them to start from their hometown, he would have said so. In fact, the apostles are all probably from Galilee, and so they are actually not starting from their hometown by starting in Jerusalem. They are starting in Jerusalem because that is where God established his temple, and that is where all devout, male Jews, 2 colon 5, came three times per year, as required under the law, Deuteronomy 16 verse 16. Therefore, many of the lost sheep of Israel would be coming to them in Jerusalem. With the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7, God set aside Israel's program and began the dispensation of grace with Paul in Acts 9. In Acts 15, there is a council between Paul and the Jerusalem church to talk about the two different programs going on. From Paul's account in Galatians 2, we learn that, at that time, the Jerusalem church recognized that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto Paul, Galatians 2 verse 7. The result was that the twelve apostles decided to constrain their ministry to saved Jews only, while Paul went to all other people with the gospel of grace, Galatians 2 verse 9. Therefore, the twelve apostles abandoned the commission of Acts 1 verse 8, recognizing that God had put Israel's program on hold and began the mystery program with Paul. As such, anyone following the Acts 1 verse 8 commission is going against what God is doing today, informing the body of Christ. 1 colon 9 with his instructions to his disciples now complete, Jesus ascends to heaven so that the little flock can continue Jesus' ministry to the lost sheep of the house of Israel through the power of the Holy Ghost. 1 colon 10 dash 11, the two men are probably the angels, Michael and Gabriel, since angels are also called men in the Bible, because they look like men. They do not have wings, as is commonly thought. The point of their statement is that the little flock needs to get their focus off of where Jesus has gone and get their focus on the job that he has called them to do. Jesus will come back to establish the kingdom on earth. In the meantime, they will not have finished going over the cities of Israel before he comes back, Matthew 10 verse 23. Therefore, they do not have time to build an altar to Jesus where he left them and worship there, looking for apparitions of Jesus, as their flesh would lead them to do. Rather, they need to go to Jerusalem 1 colon 4 and wait for the Holy Ghost to give them the power to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel with the gospel of the kingdom and signs following, Mark 16 verses 16 to 20. 1 12 Jesus ascended to heaven from the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14 verse 4 says that, when Jesus comes back, he will stand upon the Mount of Olives. Therefore, not only will Jesus come back in like manner, i.e., in a cloud, Revelation 14 verse 14, but he will also come back to the very location that he left them at. However, since Jesus told the little flock to wait for the Holy Ghost from Jerusalem, 1 colon 4, 
we see them journeying there now. 113. We are told the names of the eleven apostles here. Judas Iscariot has killed himself by now, to show that all of them were there for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. In other words, Jesus kept them from being lost. John 17 verse 12. Note the use of the word both again, although eleven are named. This shows there are two groups, one, Peter, and two, the other ten apostles. God divides them this way, because Peter is the kingdom church's God-appointed leader, Matthew 16 verses 18 to 19. This would be like saying, both the president and his men. 114 note that Mary the mother of Jesus was also there, showing that Jesus kept her from being lost, as well, by having John take her home with him, John 19 verses 25 to 27. Note also that Jesus' half-brothers are there, too. Not too long ago, his half-brothers did not believe in him, John 7 verse 5. Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead and his own resurrection must have caused them to believe the gospel of the kingdom. 115. Since Peter is God's appointed leader, he is the one who talks here. Note that there are only 120 people waiting for the arrival of the Holy Ghost. Jesus had great multitudes following him, Matthew 14 verse 14 and 20 29 including a very great multitude less than one week before his crucifixion, Matthew 21 verse 8. Once he died, though, almost all left him, such that there are only 120 believers who tarry in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Ghost, as Jesus had commanded them to 1 colon 4 dash 5. Thus, Israel, as a whole, has rejected the gospel and only has one year left to believe or be set aside by God, Luke 13 verses 6 to 9. This one year period is covered in the first seven chapters of Acts. 1 colon 16, 20 Peter was pretty ignorant when it came to the things Jesus shared with him. He did not think Jesus would die, Matthew 16 verses 21 to 22, did not believe he would rise from the dead, Luke 18 verses 33 to 34, did not believe in Jesus' resurrection even after it had already happened, John 20 verses 6 to 9, and had given up on following Jesus' commands even after Jesus had appeared to him twice after his resurrection, John 21 verse 3. Now, Peter knows the scripture so well that he knows that Judas Iscariot must be replaced as one of the twelve due to a combination of Psalm 69 verse 25, let their habitation be desolate, and Psalm 109 verse 8, let another take his office. This shows the great transformation in Peter over the last month. After his resurrection, Jesus had opened Peter's eyes such that he now understands what Jesus shared with him from Scripture, where he was clueless before Jesus' death. The reason is because he now understands what Jesus did on the cross and what God is doing now with the little flock. Today, a similar thing happens for people who study the Bible for years and then learn how to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. They know scripture, but it does not make sense until they understand the prophecy and mystery programs and the timing of everything. Then, the pieces fall into place. That is why understanding right division is essential to understanding God's word. Also, note that Peter says that these two passages from Psalms were spoken by the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David. This tells us that God did not just give some general ideas to the Bible writers and have them put those ideas in their own words. Rather, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. Every single letter and word is from God, Matthew 5 verse 18, and was written down perfectly by man, 2 Peter 1 verse 21, because the words on the page were actually spoken to us by the Holy Ghost. 118 Matthew 27 verse 5 says that Judas hanged himself. Here, we are told that Judas fell headlong, burst asunder, and all his bowels gushed out. Since all of God's word is true, John 17 verse 17, both things must have happened. Judas probably hung himself around the time of Jesus' crucifixion. When Jesus gave up the ghost, there was a great earthquake, Matthew 27 verses 50 to 51. This earthquake was probably the cause of Judas' dead body falling headlong, bursting asunder, and all of his bowels gushing out. As such, what happened to Judas' body is a type of the judgment that will come upon the wicked for rejecting what Jesus did on the cross for them. 119 The fact that all the dwellers at Jerusalem knew about the bloodbath regarding Judas Iscariot's body shows that this was no ordinary occurrence. People had hanged themselves before, 
but never had it been so gruesome. That is because betraying the Lord is the ultimate sin, deserving of the ultimate punishment. Jesus said, regarding his betrayer, good were it for that man if he had never been born, Mark 14 verse 21. Also, the gruesomeness of Judas hanging would also serve as witness that he did, in fact, betray the Son of God. Perhaps some people were saved, as a result. 1 21-23 Most Christians say that Paul replaced Judas Iscariot as the twelfth apostle, and that the disciples' appointing of Matthias was against God's will. However, two things tell us that is not true. 1. Peter was obeying scripture by replacing Judas. He was not in the flesh. He was doing God's will, fulfilling scripture. As mentioned before, Peter did not know what was going on spiritually during Jesus' ministry. Now, after spending 40 days with Jesus after his resurrection, he pieces together two scriptures to show that they needed to name a replacement for Judas. The only way he could have done this was if Jesus specifically told him to do so, which Jesus would not have done if Paul was supposed to be the twelfth apostle. And two, the twelfth apostle had to have followed Jesus from the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry until the day of Pentecost, in order to be a witness of Jesus' resurrection, 1 21-22. Paul does not fit this criteria, as he did not follow Jesus until Jesus called to him from heaven in Acts 9, 1 Timothy 1 verse 13, which makes Paul an apostle born out of due time, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 8. It is probable that the reason Barsabas and Matthias are chosen is because they are the only two men who fit this criteria. This shows that there are only 13 eligible men to be the apostles. 13 is the number of rebellion, and the nation of Israel is in rebellion at the time. Christians say Matthias is never mentioned again, so he cannot be the twelfth apostle. However, look at some of the other apostles. Bartholomew, for example, is mentioned by name only four times in Scripture, Matthew 10 verse 3, Mark 3 verse 18, Luke 6 verse 14, Acts 1 verse 13. In all four instances, he is only in a list of apostles. We have no details about him. That is because the purpose of selecting twelve apostles is so they can rule over Israel in the kingdom, Matthew 19 verse 28. Since the kingdom is still future, they have not taken that position yet, which is why we do not know anything about some of the apostles. Therefore, we should not think it odd that Matthias is never mentioned again either after Acts 1. 1 24-26 Again, Peter was not in the flesh, here, as he prayed for the Lord's guidance. The casting of lots to choose Matthias is how God communicated his will to Israel under their program. Therefore, this is not gambling. Rather, the casting of lots is how God made his choice known to Israel as seen in Leviticus 16 verse 8, Joshua 18 verse 10, and 1 Samuel 14 verses 41 to 42. If Peter was in the flesh, he would have made the choice himself, rather than asking God which knowest the hearts of all men to make his choice. It was important to bring the number of apostles up to twelve because that is God's number of government and the twelve apostles will rule over the twelve tribes of Israel in God's kingdom, Matthew 19 verse 28. Therefore, this casting of lots, according to the Mosaic law, is clear evidence that Israel's program is being continued here, and that they are still under the law. This is not the start of the body of Christ. If God did start the church in Acts 2, there would be no need to elevate Matthias over Barsabbas here. 2. The Holy Ghost comes upon the little flock of Israel to bring forth the spiritual firstfruits of the harvest, which is seen by the little flock growing in numbers from 120 to 3,120 on the first day, v. 41. As such, the Holy Ghost is separating out his nation from apostate Israel, Matthew 21 verse 43. 2. Colon 1. Note the term fully come. Pentecost was celebrated every year as the Feast of Weeks proclaimed under God's law, Exodus 34 verse 22, but the full fulfillment of this feast is the celebration of firstfruits of God's spiritual harvest. These 120 people are the firstfruits, and they are now commissioned, under the power of the Holy Ghost, to start the spiritual harvest of the lost sheep of Israel, so that Israel may be a kingdom of priests to reach the Gentiles with the gospel of the kingdom, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6. 
The word fully is key to understanding the significance of the Holy Ghost's coming. The little flocks being with one accord in one place also signifies they were not in the flesh, but were awaiting the Holy Ghost's coming in order to reach the lost sheep of Israel. 2 colon 2 The mighty wind filling the whole house should remind us of God's coming to Israel by filling the whole tabernacle that Moses and Israel built. Exodus 40 verses 34 to 35. Therefore, the Holy Ghost's filling the whole house shows that God's presence has, once again, filled all of believing Israel, as it did originally with the tabernacle in the wilderness. Also, in John 3 verse 8, Jesus links the wind to those born of the Spirit, and that they must be born of water and of the Spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God, John 3 verse 5. These 120 believers have been born of both now. In Acts 2 verse 38, Peter will give the invitation to those in Jerusalem for them to be born of water, water baptized, and born of the Spirit, by repenting, which means to change their minds and believe the gospel of the kingdom, so that they can also enter the kingdom of God. 2 colon 3 dash 4 in Genesis 11, the whole world spoke one language. Because man united in rebellion against God, God created many languages as a way to keep man from becoming fully apostate. By giving the gift of speaking in other tongues to his little flock, God is uniting the world back to God, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6. The tongues are as of fire, because God had promised to refine Israel by fire, Malachi 3 verses 2 to 3, meaning that they would go through the fiery trials of the tribulation period in order to determine if they will side with God or with Satan. If they reject the gospel they hear, Through the Holy Ghost, they will be baptized with that fire by going to the lake of fire, Matthew 3 verses 11 to 12. If they believe the gospel, they will receive the Holy Ghost and be refined by that fire so that they have pure souls, making it into God's kingdom on earth. Thus, the fire both divides apostate Israel from believing Israel and purifies believing Israel. This is why the tongues were cloven, which means divided or split in two. This is also why the national symbol of Israel is the burning bush, Exodus 3 verse 2, not the pagan star of David. Now, the Pentecostals love to quote 2 colon 4 to show that you do not have the Holy Ghost, unless you speak in other tongues, because that is what happened here. However, as mentioned, Acts 2 is a continuation of Israel's program. It is not the dispensation of grace, which does not begin until Acts 9. 2 colon 6 tells us that these other tongues were man's languages that were understood by other nations. The speaking in tongues by the Pentecostals today is not an understandable language. In fact, it is just gibberish to create an emotional release and to make the speaker proud in his supposed spiritual maturity. However, even if it were a real language given by God, it would be a spiritual language that no man understands, as Paul goes over in 1 Corinthians 12-14 rather than a real language spoken by men in other countries. Therefore, speaking in other tongues or languages is specific to Israel's program. Therefore, even if speaking in tongues is of God today, it would not be done in this manner, because Acts 2 is a different dispensation than the one we are currently living in, which means that speaking in tongues is not the evidence of having the Holy Ghost. Also, note that the Pentecostals experience being slain in the Spirit with uncontrollable gyrations in the Spirit. However, neither of these things is found anywhere in Scripture not even here except as it relates to the devil, e.g., Mark 9 verses 17 to 22. Romans 5 verses 3 to 5 says that the Holy Ghost is given unto us today so that God's love is shed abroad in our hearts through the trials we go through as we walk in the Spirit which means living out sound doctrine for today so that others may be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. This is the opposite of uncontrollable gyrations and speaking in gibberish, which makes the Pentecostals look like devil-possessed loons. Even when tongues were of God in the dispensation of grace, Paul admits that unbelievers who heard such things would say that the speakers were mad, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 23. How much more so, then, is this the case since tongues have now passed off the scene, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8. 2 colon 5 due to the fifth cycle of chastisement, Israel was scattered abroad among the nations, Leviticus 26 verse 33, but the faithful to God's law would return to Jerusalem for Pentecost as God had commanded, 
Deuteronomy 16 verse 16. Therefore, the devout men of Jewish descent are in Jerusalem at this time out of every nation under heaven, 2 colon 5, 2 colon 6, we see a reversal of the Tower of Babel here. The little flock speaks the wonderful works of God, 2 11, and the Holy Ghost translates it for the hearer into the hearer's language. The purpose of the other tongues, then, is so that the language barrier is removed so that all people may hear the gospel of the kingdom and believe. Thus, there is no confusion, and there is complete understanding by all listening. Contrast this with today's Pentecostal movement, which has nothing to do with uniting God's people into one language. In fact, Pentecostalism today is the opposite, taking a group of people who speak one language and dividing them with a language that none of them understands. 2 colon 7 It is significant that the little flock is comprised of Galileans, which the Jewish community considered to be like Gentiles, due to their lack of Jewish religious observance, Matthew 4 verses 15 to 16. By contrast, the Jewish religious area of Jerusalem, where the real holy people dwell, does not seem to be represented here. This shows that it is much harder for a religious person to believe the gospel than for a particularly wicked person to do so. 2 colon 8 Note that this verse does not say that the little flock spoke in many languages. Rather, the scripture says that every man heard in their own tongue. Therefore, speaking in other tongues really means that the speakers speak one language, but the hearers hear that message in their own language. Thus, the speakers are speaking in unison, which is another confirmation that God is speaking through them, as unison speaking in tongues never happens. In Pentecostalism today, it is this unison speaking that keeps confusion from happening and brings the clarity of the gospel to all hearers. Also, the fact that they hear in their own tongues is confirmation that God is at work here. After all, how could ignorant Galileans know so many languages? 413. The reason everyone hearing the word of God in their own tongue is so important is because that is the only way that the whole world will hear the gospel of the kingdom before the end of the tribulation period. Jesus sent the little flock to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10 verses 5 to 6, and he said that they would not finish going through all of Israel before Jesus' second coming, Matthew 10 verse 23. Jesus also said that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations before the end, Matthew 24 verse 14. So, how does the whole world hear the gospel when the little flock does not even go to cities outside of Israel? The answer is that the little flock will be arrested and will speak before councils, rulers, and kings, Mark 13 verse 9. At that time, the Holy Ghost will speak through them, Mark 13 verse 11. In other words, the Holy Ghost will speak the gospel of the kingdom through them, and all nations will hear that gospel in their own tongues, as they watch on the latest technology device. That is how the gospel is published among all nations, Mark 13 verse 10. Therefore, the gospel of the kingdom would not go to every nation in the tribulation period if not for the Holy Ghost's gift of tongues. 2.10 Note that there were also proselytes here, meaning Gentiles who had become Jews. In Israel's program, Gentiles could be saved by either blessing Israel, Genesis 12 verse 3, or by becoming proselytes. 2.12-13 We see two groups of observers here. The devout Jews, coming to the feast, wonder what this means while others come up with a flimsy excuse to try to explain how this is not of God. It is flimsy because the mockers claim that those speaking in other tongues are drunk. However, drunkenness hinders communication, while the Holy Ghost is enhancing communication by causing men to interpret the same set of words into their own language. Dialects Thus, drunkenness cannot be the reason for the little flock speaking in other tongues since drunkenness has the opposite effect of what is really going on here. If they were drunken, it means that they are not thinking with their right minds, but they are really speaking clearly the wonderful works of God. Similarly today, when we rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, we are using the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16, communicating clearly. However, because Christianity uses corrupt minds, 1 Timothy 6 verse 5, they say we are confusing matters and speaking like we are crazy. Therefore, the reaction to the truth in 2.13 is the same reaction we get today from unbelievers. 
2.14 As in 1.13, the twelve apostles are divided into two groups, one, Peter, and two, the eleven, because Peter is the God-appointed leader of the little flock. Note that Peter is not preaching to all of mankind. He is only preaching to Jews, because Jesus was only sent unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15 verse 24, and Jesus sent the little flock as his father sent him, John 20 verse 21. Therefore, the little flock is only to preach to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is why Peter addresses his sermon to ye men of Judea, 2.14, ye men of Israel, 2.22, and all the house of Israel, 2.36. 2.15, because the mockers are clearly wrong, it only takes this one statement to refute them. Note that Peter says that it was but the third hour of the day. According to Mark 15 verse 25, Jesus was crucified at the third hour. Therefore, God probably poured out the Holy Ghost at this time to signify that Jesus' crucifixion made this possible and also to show that man cannot stop God's plan. 2.16 The answer to the question of what meaneth this is that this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Peter then quotes Joel 2 verses 28 to 32. Again, Peter goes from being a bumbling idiot before the cross to being extremely knowledgeable after the cross. This shows the work of Jesus and the Holy Ghost in his life. 2.17 Since this is that, Israel has entered the last days, which will end in the great and notable day of the Lord, 2.20, which is a reference to Christ's second coming, Isaiah 13 verse 9 and Joel 1 colon 15, 2 colon 1, 11. Daniel 9 verses 26 to 27 says that there are at least seven years between Jesus' death and the end of the tribulation period. However, due to the unbelief of Israel at Jesus' first coming, Luke 13 verses 6 to 9 says that God would give Israel a one-year grace period before starting the tribulation period. Therefore, with the pouring out of the Holy Ghost, that one-year grace period has now started to be followed by the seven-year tribulation period to be followed by God's pouring out of wrath upon unbelieving Israel. The all flesh of 2.17 does not include the Gentiles, because it is explained by what comes after it to mean your sons, your daughters, your young men, and your old men. Previously, in Israel's program, only one or two people typically received the Holy Spirit, such as the king or a prophet. God is saying that all of believing Israel will now receive the Holy Ghost sons, daughters, young, and old. Those who try to claim speaking in tongues and moving in the Spirit for themselves today are trying to steal Israel's promises without accepting the associated curses of blood and fire and the day of God's judgment. 2 colon 19-20 2 18 The reason that all of believing Israel now receives the Holy Ghost is so they can prophesy. Prophesying refers to speaking forth the word of the Lord. Thus, they are to all go out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and speak the gospel of the kingdom to them. If Pentecostalists are correct in saying that speaking with other tongues is for today, then how are they prophesying when no one can understand what they are saying? John 7 verses 38 to 39 says that the Holy Spirit is living water. Therefore, it makes sense that God says that he will pour out his spirit. 2.18 also, note that God says that his servants and handmaidens will receive the Holy Spirit, 2.18. This is a reference to all of the little flock, because it is their duty, as servants, Leviticus 25 verse 55, to preach the gospel of the kingdom to Israel, Luke 17 verse 10. 2 colon 19-20 In addition to hearing the gospel of the kingdom and seeing the signs of the kingdom, casting out devils and healing the sick, Mark 16 verses 17 to 18, Israel will also see the signs of God's judgment for those who do not believe. Note that the signs will be in creation, so that there is no mistake that God is doing them, not man. Also, the signs are of blood and fire. Blood represents life, Leviticus 17 verse 11, and fire represents the lake of fire. Thus, the signs of blood and fire are visual, graphic representations of apostate Israel burning forever in the lake of fire if they do not repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, 238. It seems odd, then, that the Salvation Army would use blood and fire in their flag. John tells, in Revelation 6 verse 12 and 8 12, of these signs coming to pass in the tribulation period. 
These signs are part of the refiner's fire of God to get apostate Israel to believe the gospel of the kingdom, Malachi 3 verses 2 to 3. By the way, the signs in the earth beneath refer to what is seen in Revelation 8 verses 7 to 8, where trees and grass are burned with fire and blood, a great mountain is burned with fire, and the sea turns into blood as a sign of God's soon judgment of the unbelievers. In other words, since God created the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1 verse 1, it is clear to man that they are about to be judged by God when he puts these signs of judgment in both heaven and earth. The sun being turned into darkness and the moon being turned into blood, 220, are signs after the end of the tribulation period and before Jesus' second coming, Matthew 24 verse 29. In other words, God turns the lights out to give man time to contemplate what just happened. Then, those who call on the name of the Lord can be saved, 221. 221 Thus, the tribulation period is God's reconciliation program for the nation of Israel. Saved Israel will speak the gospel to the rest of Israel during the tribulation period, and God will help lost Israel to see that God's wrath is about to be poured out upon them by seeing the signs of blood and fire. This is God's twofold warning system so that Israel will believe the gospel in order to be saved, 221, from the great and notable day of the Lord, 220. For Israel, most of this salvation occurs during the period of darkness, just before Jesus' second coming. This is seen in the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25 verses 1 to 13. There, we see the little flock give the midnight, because it is dark, cry that the bridegroom is coming, Matthew 25 verse 6. Jesus comes as a thief in the night, 2 Peter 3 verse 10. Dot. The ten virgins had all been sleeping during the tribulation period, Matthew 25 verse 5 and so they have to scramble to believe the gospel, and only five of them make it in, Matthew 25 verse 10. These are the ones who call upon the name of the Lord by believing the gospel of the kingdom and are saved, 221. 2.22-23 Now, Peter tells Israel why they will soon be judged by God into the lake of fire. It is because they took their Messiah and killed him. Note how Peter says that Jesus was a man approved of God. This means that he was their Messiah. Jesus was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God to be bound upon the altar in the temple and sacrificed for the sins of Israel, Psalm 118 verse 27. Instead of doing this in faith, Israel, in unbelief, took Jesus by wicked hands and crucified and killed him. Therefore, they are deserving of God's wrath being poured out upon them at Jesus' second coming. Although both ways involved Jesus dying, eternal life with God is always linked to faith in what God has revealed to you. Therefore, the issue is not Jesus' death, but it is Israel's unbelief. Christians like to say that there is only one gospel in the Bible, and it involves believing that Jesus died for your sins. However, the gospel that the twelve apostles preached was the gospel of the kingdom, which was to repent and be baptized. For the remission of sins, 238, the twelve apostles began preaching the gospel, Luke 9 verse 6, about two years before Jesus' death, and they did not even know that he was supposed to die and rise from the dead until after he had already done so, John 20 verse 9. Therefore, they could not have preached Jesus' death as part of their gospel. Now, for the first time, they preached the gospel, knowing that Jesus died for Israel's sins, and they still preach the same gospel as they did before the cross. In other words, the new information about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection does not change the good news God has given to man at that time, because God is continuing Israel's program. He has not started something new at Acts 2. Peter does mention Jesus' death, but he mentions it, here, as bad news, not good news. He says that God gave Jesus as the Lamb of God to take away their sins, John 1 verse 29, and, in disobedience, Israel took the sacrificial lamb and killed him in unbelief on a cross, so that he could not die on the altar in the temple as God said he was to do, Psalm 118 verse 27. Therefore, Israel is subject to God's wrath, because they killed their Messiah, 236. In other words, Peter is saying that, because Israel killed Jesus on a cross, they are headed for hell, instead of being part of God's kingdom on earth. That is not good news. By contrast, when Paul preaches about Jesus' death, he preaches it as good news, i.e., 
the gospel that gives them eternal life, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. This makes it clear that Peter preached a different gospel than Paul preached. 224 Israel tried to get rid of their Messiah by killing him, but God intervened to raise him from the dead. The reason that Jesus rose from the dead is because the wages of sin is death, Romans 6 verse 23, but Jesus Christ never sinned, Hebrews 4 verse 15. Therefore, the justice of God demanded that he rise from the dead. By going to hell, Psalm 16 verse 10, Acts 2 verse 27, when he did not deserve hell, Jesus Christ fought death and won. Therefore, he gives believers the victory over death, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 55 to 57. 2 colon 25 dash 28, this is a quote of Psalm 16 verses 8 to 11. By Peter's use of this under the direction of the Holy Spirit, we learn that these verses, written by David, were actually spoken by Jesus in his death. In other words, Peter is saying that Jesus had to be raised from the dead. He could not stay in hell, because God's justice would not allow thine holy one, 227, being a perfect man, to be part of Satan's kingdom. The Lord watched Jesus the whole time, 225, making sure he was not corrupted by Satan in hell, because the justice of God would not allow such a thing to happen. In fact, Jesus' flesh actually rested in hell, 226, having the confident expectation that God would raise him from the dead. This is the ultimate example of faith in God to be able to rest in hope while in hell. Thus, Peter gives this as the explanation of why Jesus' death proves that he is the Messiah, rather than proving that he is not the Messiah, as the natural mind would think. This passage also sheds light on Psalm 139 verse 8, which says, If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Therefore, this passage means that God the Father did not leave Jesus' soul in hell, because he was watching the whole time to make sure he did not suffer corruption. 2 colon 29-32 Although David wrote the Psalms in the first person, this Psalm could not have been about David himself, because he had not yet been resurrected from the dead. Therefore, if Peter's audience believes that all scripture is true, they will have to conclude that in disobedience, Israel took the sacrificial lamb and killed him in unbelief on a cross, so that he could not die on the altar in the temple as God said he was to do, Psalm 118 verse 27. Therefore, Israel is subject to God's wrath, because they killed their Messiah, 236. In other words, Peter is saying that, because Israel killed Jesus on a cross, they are headed for hell, instead of being part of God's kingdom on earth. That is not good news. In contrast, when Paul preaches about Jesus' death, he preaches it as good news, i.e., the gospel that gives them eternal life, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. This makes it clear that Peter preached a different gospel than Paul preached. 224 Israel tried to get rid of their Messiah by killing him, but God intervened to raise him from the dead. The reason that Jesus rose from the dead is because the wages of sin is death, Romans 6 verse 23. But Jesus Christ never sinned, Hebrews 4 verse 15. Therefore, the justice of God demanded that he rise from the dead. By going to hell, Psalm 16 verse 10, Acts 2 verse 27, when he did not deserve hell, Jesus Christ fought death and won. Therefore, he gives believers the victory over death, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 55 to 57. 2 colon 25 dash 28, this is a quote of Psalm 16 verses 8 to 11. By Peter's use of this under the direction of the Holy Spirit, we learn that these verses, written by David, were actually spoken by Jesus in his death. In other words, Peter is saying that Jesus had to be raised from the dead. He could not stay in hell, because God's justice would not allow thine holy one, 227, being a perfect man, to be part of Satan's kingdom. The Lord watched Jesus the whole time, 225, making sure he was not corrupted by Satan in hell, because the justice of God would not allow such a thing to happen. In fact, Jesus' flesh actually rested in hell, 226, having the confident expectation that God would raise him from the dead. This is the ultimate example of faith in God to be able to rest in hope while in hell. Thus, Peter gives this as the explanation of why Jesus' death proves that he is the Messiah rather than proving that he is not the Messiah, as the natural mind would think.
This passage also sheds light on Psalm 139 verse 8, which says, If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Therefore, this passage means that God the Father did not leave Jesus' soul in hell, because he was watching the whole time to make sure he did not suffer corruption. 2 colon 29-32 Although David wrote the Psalms in the first person, this Psalm could not have been about David himself, because he had not yet been resurrected from the dead. Therefore, if Peter's audience believes that all scripture is true, they will have to conclude that Peter is correct in saying that David wrote Psalm 16 verses 8 to 11 as a prophecy about the Messiah's resurrection from the dead. Thus, Peter is proving to the Jews that the Old Testament prophesied that the Messiah would not sin, would die, and would be raised from the dead by God. Only the Lord Jesus Christ fulfills all three aspects. Therefore, he must be their Messiah. Peter also shows how David could write in the first person and still be talking about the Messiah. The way he does this is because God made a covenant with David that David's throne would be established forever, 2 Samuel 7 verse 16, through God established David's son's throne forever, 2 Samuel 7 verses 13 to 15. That son is the Messiah. Since David's promise is fulfilled by his son's promise being fulfilled, David can write in the first person about his son, and it is true also about himself. This is what Peter explains in 2 colon 30-31 by saying that David saw this beforehand, such that David could speak in the first person of the Messiah's resurrection. Also, note that 2.30 says that David was a prophet. Christians usually think of the Psalms as devotionals with relative truths that God somehow mystically applies to their lives. But, God says that the Psalms are prophecy, they have definite meanings, and the truths, found in them, apply to Israel's program, not to us today. Therefore, if you rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, you will learn that the Psalms talk about Israel and the Messiah, both in tribulation and in the kingdom, among other things. These truths are not discovered in Christianity's devotional books. 2 33-35 Peter now quotes another passage from Psalms to show that it also applies to the Messiah, not to David. Psalm 110 verse 1 says that the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand. Thus, God the Father, the first Lord in the passage, is saying to God the Son, the second Lord in the passage, to sit at God the Father's right hand. Since David is not ascended into the heavens, this scripture must also speak of the Messiah. The Messiah, then, is at God's right hand. As such, he gives the Holy Ghost to the little flock. Israel had been looking for their Messiah to come, overthrow the Romans, and make Israel the world power again. A believing remnant put their hope in Jesus, thinking he was the Messiah, but this remnant left him when he was crucified, because they assumed that death was not part of God's plan. However, what Peter has just shared with the devout Jews gathered in Jerusalem for Pentecost, 2 colon 5, is that it was God's plan all along for their Messiah to die. By doing so, their Messiah conquered death, 224, became Lord, 236, sat down at the position of power over the whole world, 234, and has now given the Holy Ghost to the believing remnant, 233, so that they may endure unto the end of the tribulation period and enter God's eternal kingdom on earth. Therefore, rather than Jesus' death being the end of him being the Messiah, it is actually just the beginning. 2 colon 34-36 in 2.12, the devout Jews asked the little flock what meant this, referring to the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Now, Peter tells them that it means that they are in big trouble. He has proven from scripture that the Lord Jesus Christ is Israel's Messiah. Israel had taken their Messiah and crucified and slayed him by wicked hands, Acts 2 verse 23. Through his death, he is Lord, so that he is now both Lord and Christ, 236. Therefore, they have just killed their Lord. God the Father says that Jesus will sit in heaven until I make thy foes thy footstool. The wicked people who killed Jesus must be his foes. Israel was God's nation, above all other nations, Deuteronomy 7 verse 6. Because the nation had become apostate, God promised to take the kingdom away from the apostate nation and give it to the believing remnant in Israel, Matthew. 2143, Luke 12 verse 32. Since Jesus is now sitting at the right hand of the Father, he certainly has the power to do this. 
Since Israel crucified Jesus, 236, they will be destroyed and cast into the lake of fire if their current situation does not change. 237 The reason that Peter is the one who speaks to these Jews is because Jesus gave him the keys to the kingdom and gave him the authority to loose or bind things on earth, Matthew 16 verses 18 to 19, which includes the authority to retain or remit sins, John 20 verses 22 to 23. Therefore, Peter has just pronounced God's judgment upon all the house of Israel, 236, for killing their Messiah. Thus, the response of the devout Jews is, what shall we do? Note the term pricked in their heart. When something is pricked, what is inside slowly begins to leak out. Because these men are devout Jews, 2 colon 5, they sincerely want to follow God's law covenant with them and have killed Jesus out of ignorance, 317. Therefore, the pricking of their hearts means that they now realize that killing Jesus was actually a bad thing. They then repent or change their minds about Jesus, and so they want to know what they can do to get out from God's wrath being poured upon them. Contrast this with the Jewish religious leaders who were also cut to the heart, 754. Their response was to try to destroy God's messenger by gnawing on him, 754, and stoning him to death, 7, 58-60. This demonstrates how believers beg for mercy from the messenger, while unbelievers seek to silence the messenger by killing him or doing away with him. Today, when confronted with the truth, unbelievers often kill the messenger by ignoring the truth he proclaims or by calling him crazy. 238 Because they killed Jesus out of ignorance, 317, God gives them a way out of his wrath. This way is to repent and be baptized, which is the gospel to them. Then, their sins will be remitted, and they also will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Because Christians try to apply acts to themselves today, and they do not believe that water baptism is required for salvation, they change this verse to read that they are to be water baptized because they have already repented and received remission of sins. This explanation makes absolutely no sense. First, the context tells us that these people had no idea that they were guilty of killing their Lord and Messiah. If they did, they would not have asked the question, what shall we do? Second, if they had already repented and had received remission of sins, Peter would have said be baptized, because your sins have been remitted. He would have left out the repentance part. Only by rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, does this verse make perfect sense. God had called Israel to be his kingdom of priests, to reconcile the earth back to himself, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6. A priest was required to be washed with water and anointed with oil, Exodus 29 verses 4 and 7, with the anointing of oil being a type of receiving the Holy Ghost. Before John the Baptist, only the Levitical priests would be washed with water and anointed with oil. However, John the Baptist came preaching, Repent ye! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3 verse 2. Since Israel needed to be cleansed to be priests to the Gentiles, because the kingdom of heaven was now at hand, John the Baptist started baptizing all Israelites who repented, Matthew 3 verses 2 and 6. Repentance means a change of mind. The only way Israel could enter God's kingdom is if they believed that their own righteousness was as filthy rags, Isaiah 64 verse 6. Therefore, they had to jettison the idea of following the Jewish traditions to work their way into the kingdom and believe that God would give them his imputed righteousness through the law covenant he had made with them. If they did this, they would have repented. Then, they would see the requirement to be water baptized to be saved. As Jesus said in Mark 16 verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Their belief in the gospel of the kingdom means they have repented. Their water baptism means they have joined saved Israel's priestly kingdom. Then, God would give them the Holy Ghost, because he is the anointing with oil that makes them full-fledged priests. Also, water baptism cleanses them from their idolatry, Ezekiel 36 verse 25. Therefore, water baptism is an absolute requirement for salvation at this time but it is only required for Israel during the at-hand phase of the kingdom. Today, though, in the dispensation of grace, it is not part of the gospel, for Paul said that Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. 
Thus, Paul sets water baptism in contrast to the gospel. While Jesus says that water baptism is a part of the gospel, Mark 16 verse 16, Paul's good news to us today is to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4, while Jesus' death was Peter's bad news to Israel, 2 colon 23, 36. Therefore, you will be following the wrong gospel if you do not understand that Acts 2 verse 38 is not written to you today. 239, because God is building up Israel to be a kingdom of priests, the promise of the Holy Ghost is only to Israel at this point. Note, in 236, that Peter is addressing only Israel, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. So, the promise is only to you, the Jews, your children, more Jews, and all that are afar off, which would be Jews, out of every nation under heaven, 2 colon 5, since the Jews had been scattered among the heathen according to the fifth cycle of chastisement, Leviticus 26 verse 33. So, the Holy Ghost is being given to all saved Jews, 2 colon 17 18, whereas, before this point, the Holy Spirit was given only to certain Jews for a certain task, e.g., Bezalel to build the tabernacle, Exodus 31 verses 2 to 5. Therefore, all believing Jews are now water baptized and receive the Holy Ghost, when both were limited to only certain people before Acts 2. It is important to recognize that 239 and 2,17-18 limits the Holy Ghost coming upon Jews only so that, when the Holy Ghost does come upon Gentiles in 10,44-45, you will recognize that God had started the dispensation of grace by then. Further confirmation that the Holy Ghost was given only to Jews is seen in that saved Jews were astonished when the Holy Ghost came upon Gentiles in 10 colon 44 dash 45. 240 again, the audience is Israel. Israel, as a whole, is guilty of using wicked hands to crucify and slay their Lord and Messiah. Thus, Israel is perverse or untoward, meaning that they are not toward God. Jesus said that that generation was a generation of vipers that could not escape the damnation of hell, Matthew 23 verse 33. Individual Jews are now called to depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, Isaiah 52 verse 11, and flee from the wrath to come, Matthew 3 verse 7, by believing the gospel of repent and be baptized, 238. 241 In just one day, the little flock grows by 2,500% by going from 120 to 3,120 believers. And, this was all the Lord's doing. The devout Jews came to the place where the little flock was, they heard them speaking in their own languages, and the Holy Ghost spoke a message to them that led them to believe the gospel and be saved. This shows how clear it was to the Jews present, with the heart to here, that Jesus is Israel's Messiah and Lord. This also shows that the method of baptizing had to have been sprinkling. From a practical standpoint, if each member of the little flock baptized an equal number of believers, they would have each baptized 25 people. More importantly, though, God had said that he would sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, Ezekiel 36 verse 25. Therefore, these 3,000 souls were baptized in water by a sprinkling. 2.42 a.m. popular non-denominational church today uses this verse to say that these are the four pillars of the early church that we should follow today. Funny that they do not sell all their possessions and distribute them among fellow believers, as Jesus commanded all members of the little flock to do in Luke 12 verse 33, and as we see all of them doing in Acts 2 verses 44 to 45. By rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, we know that the body of Christ is not in view here. Rather, the little flock is being built up by God so that Israel will be a kingdom of priests to reach the Gentiles with the gospel in Jesus' millennial reign. Thus, this verse is not to be applied today. 1. The apostles' doctrine would be what Jesus taught, as Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. This would include Moses' law, as Jesus told them in Matthew. 23,2-3a, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. Therefore, the apostles' doctrine is Moses' law, 
which includes, among other things, bringing animal sacrifices to the temple for each child who is born, Leviticus 12 verses 6 to 8, not wearing clothes mixed with wool and linen, Leviticus 19 verse 19, and not having round beards, Leviticus 19 verse 27. With the Holy Ghost being given to the little flock, the Apostles' doctrine also includes loving one another with Christ's love, John 13 verse 34, and preaching the gospel, Matthew 10 verses 6 to 8. 2. The Apostles' fellowship involves selling all that they have and distributing as every man has need, Acts 2 verses 44 to 45 and Luke 12 verse 33, since all of their assets will be taken away from them halfway through the tribulation period, because they will not be able to buy and sell, because they will not take the mark of the beast, Revelation 13 verse 17. Thus, they might as well use all of their assets now, for the advancement of the kingdom of God. 3. Breaking of bread would have been them eating meals together, going house to house, 246, so that the little flock may be united, as God is, in order to further the gospel, John 17 verses 22 to 23. 4. Prayers would have been along the line of what Jesus had told them to pray in Matthew 6 verses 9 to 13, which would center around God's kingdom coming on earth, asking for daily bread from the Lord, since they would not be able to buy and sell food, forgiving others to keep the unity in the spirit as they preach the gospel of the kingdom to the lost sheep of Israel, and being delivered from having to face apostate Israel and the Antichrist so that their faith does not waver, James 1 verses 5 to 6. By contrast, in the dispensation of grace, our prayers are to be focused on the spiritual only. And, if you need daily bread, work at a job to get it. Note the contrast between what Jesus said and what Paul said. Jesus, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink. Matthew 6 verse 25. Paul, if any would not work, neither should he eat. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10. Therefore, very little of 242 is actually practiced today, which is good, because it is not for this dispensation. Today, our doctrine is found in Paul's epistles, our fellowship is with Christ's sufferings by allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us through our intake of God's word rightly divided, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9, Philippians 3 verse 10, Galatians 5 verse 16, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 14, 2 Timothy 2 verses 7 and 15. Our breaking of bread is eating a meal with believers as the body of Christ, and our prayers are all spiritual, asking for God's twofold will to be done of salvation and edification of believers, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. 243 An example of the fear that came upon every soul is seen in 5 colon 1-11, where a husband and wife are killed for lying to the Holy Ghost. This is not the loving God of the New Testament, but the vengeful God of the Old Testament. Actually, they are one and the same, and God pours out more of His wrath in the New Testament than He does in the Old Testament. See Revelation 14 verses 18 to 20. But, the point is that the fear is another evidence of the continuation of the Old Testament law covenant here in early Acts, since, in Israel's program, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, Proverbs 1 verse 7. 2 44-47 Some Christians will claim the speaking in tongues through the Holy Ghost, 2 colon 4, and some Christians will claim 242 as the four pillars of the church today, but you do not see Christian denominations claiming 2 colon 44-45. The little flock sold their possessions because the Lord commanded them to, Luke 12 verse 33. The reason he commanded them to was because they would soon have to give up all their possessions to the Antichrist, because they would not take the mark of the beast, Revelation 13 verse 17. Therefore, they might as well sell what they had to further the gospel of the kingdom. The way that this furthered the gospel of the kingdom is seen in 2 colon 46-47. By selling their possessions, they had money to sustain them so that they did not have to work for a living. This enabled them to be fellowshipping together all the time. They fellowshipped over God's word to them. They had a lot of bad religion built into them that had to be purged out through the holy word of God. Therefore, they used their time getting bad doctrine out and putting good doctrine in, which would enable them to go from city to city in Israel, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. This is how they achieved singleness of heart. In the meantime, they were also going to the temple every day, preaching the gospel of the kingdom there, 
which resulted in daily increases to the little flock of Israel. Thus, at this point, God's saved nation of Israel is growing quickly. It was okay to sell what they had because the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3 verse 2. According to Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27, there were 70 weeks of years, which equals 490 years, that were left before God would bring in the kingdom. The 69th week ended with the Messiah's crucifixion. This meant that, in this timeline, the Antichrist would come soon and make a seven-year covenant with Israel. This covenant is the seven-year tribulation period. Then, Jesus would come back and establish his kingdom on earth, Daniel 2 verse 44. None of the events after Jesus' crucifixion happened, due to the unbelief of Israel, 751. However, if Israel had believed, the little flock was probably less than 10 years away from the kingdom starting at this point, which is why it made sense for them to sell all their possessions. By contrast, today, we do not have a timeline for when the rapture will take place, which is why we are not commanded to sell our possessions today. Therefore, we should continue to keep our jobs and provide food for our households, 1 Timothy 5 verse 8. We should note that having favor with all the people, 247, does not mean that the Jewish religious leaders left them alone. In fact, some of the apostles will be arrested by the religious leaders in 4, 1-3. Rather, the favor they had was with the common Jews. They listened to what the apostles said and those in the crowd, who were part of the lost sheep of the house of Israel, were saved. These are the ones, who were added to the church daily, such as should be saved, 247. That is not to say, that God predestinated some, to eternal life, and some, to the lake of fire. Rather, the ones, that should be saved, were those who had faith in the gospel preached to them. The others, out of their own free will, chose to continue to trust in their own self-righteousness, and were not saved.